Okay, this is part one of five. Um, in this section, we're going to define or sh show what it means to define a discrete time random process. And we're only going to focus on Markov chains. The notes has some other examples, uh, including random walks and stationary processes, and I'm gonna leave that up to self-study. It's important for me to just focus on the main line in the course, which is about Markov chains. So in the introduction, I alluded to this. A random process, it doesn't require new mathematics. It, we can just use a set of random variables. But a set of random variables isn't enough to define a process. They have to be ordered. Um, they have to take on the same value over time or have a, a come from the same state space set. And lastly, it's not enough to know the marginal distributions. You also have to know the whole joint distribution and how the marginal distributions relate to each other. So to write a little bit more of a precise informal definition, a random process is a joint distribution, not enough to know the marginals, of a set of S-valued random variables. So we denote that with the set where T is an ordered set. So we have all the tools we need from second year courses to be able to, to deal with a whole random process. So a discrete time random process or random mark of chain um, Okay, definition 1.1 says, a discrete time Markov chain is a random process with a discrete state space where the following equality holds. To interpret that, um, you can just notice that this part um, of the expression behind the conditional sign gets dropped on the other side of the equality. So it essentially points to the, the property that you don't need to know the past of the process because all of these time periods are ordered. You only need to know the present state. Now that just because we're saying you don't need to know the past of the process doesn't refer to anything statistical. We don't need to know any data. It's a probability theory question. It says that to be able to define a conditional probability, it's equal to some other conditional probability where we need less information. Um, to give you an appreciation for why this property was selected and, and um, has so much prominence in this course is I just rewrote out the chain rule at the bottom here. Chain rule of probability. Um, and as you can see, the joint distribution uh, is equal to the conditional uh, um, distribution based on some of the values multiplied by that conditional event happening. Now, this is important because if you want to de fully define a random process, you need to fully define any joint probability in this way. Now, the, uh, writing out a joint probability like this relies on the fact that the state space is finite because we're setting things equal to each other and that the time periods are finite. So this is discrete time, discrete space, um, random process, but if you can write it out like that, to fully define the process, you just need to define all the joint probabilities of the shape. And the Markov property is saying, you don't need to define too many of these. You can just collapse um, all of this information and only um, provide the information about the one step conditional probability or the conditional probability of the latest point in time. So it's a big simplifying assumption, and it's not obvious at this point why it's so fundamental to discrete random processes in general, but we will get there um, shortly. It actually turns out that all discrete time random processes, if you pick the right state space, is a Markov process. But the course doesn't deal with it. Uh, I might get back to, to mentioning that fact a little bit later in the course, but it's worth pointing out at this point. Now we're going to prove a theorem. For a Markov chain, prove that the following equations hold for all states or any pair ij in the state space and all integer times that lie in a straight line like that um, from the time set, the natural numbers. So you can say, take any conditional probability where there's only one, and you can express this as a sum 
running through all possibilities of the state space in the middle over there. So you recognize the um, XM on, the, on that side and the XN on this side, we're running through the state space in the middle. And to prove this, you are going to use, um, or th this equation is known as the chapman kolmogorov equations, and for this, you're going to use the law of total probability. So you might not have come across this in uh, previous courses, but this is true for any set of random variables, not just random processes. So given a partition of the state space, a partition in maths is, if you have a state space, um, especially when it's finite, in this case, it's infinite, but if we had a finite state space, a partition takes the state space and breaks it up into non-intersecting pieces that jointly make up the whole. That is the definition of a partition. So it says, take your state space, create a partition, then this equation holds, where you have the conditional on C and you're running through all the possibilities of the partition AK. We are going to select, because we, uh, we know our state space is the natural numbers, we are going to choose the most finely grained partition, where every set represents one integer. Okay, so if you take a t to be that definition, then you simply plug that into the law of total probability to come up with the chapman kolmogorov equation. And that's a one-step proof it's almost as much work to remember the law of total probability as it is to do the proof, so it's worth doing that. Okay, next we're going to look at a corollary of the chapman kolmogorov equations. So in the first bullet, I just reiterate everything we've got so far. So if a random process has a discrete time set, a discrete state space set, and the Markov property, we've already called that a Markov chain, and we have defined all the conditional probabilities that are one time period apart, then we have to find all other conditional probabilities. And this is just an iterative application of the chapman kolmogorov equation. The second bullet says, and therefore we've defined all joint probabilities by the chain rule. So going back to just see this again, if we want to define any joint probability, we just need to know some of the conditionals. The Markov property tells us we need to know um, only the conditional on there, and the chapman kolmogorov tells us we only need the one-step conditional. So that brings us to say, to calculate any joint probability, we only need, by the chain rule, we only need to know the one-step transition probability. So already that shows us that one step transition probabilities fully define the random process because we can calculate any joint probability and therefore the whole random process as i've just said um, a little nuance in the in the last um, second last bullet it says the initial probability distribution along with all the one step conditional probabilities fully define the random process x um, just pointing out that you need to know the initial probability distribution because with the chain rule, you can always keep applying your conditionals until you get to x0. Then you can't apply the conditionals anymore. So you need to know your initial state and all the one-step conditional probabilities. Then you've defined the whole process. Um, and this last bullet says that the one-step conditional probability can also be represented as an error. So it's just a simple fact that I'm pointing out that if you've defined all the probabilities, if you've given a number, a practical number, to every one step, one step refers to that time period being one apart, if you've given a probability to each of those, then you fully define the process, but you can also represent this information like this, without all the other algebraic notation. So it's just important to know that, um, this is the wrong way around, J is earlier in the conditional. So going from J to I with probability P, the arrow just indicates basically which side of the conditional we're on. And this is often a little bit easier to write. Also, it's much neater if you've got all your one-step probabilities where multiple of them end up in I 
will start from J. So um, this representation of the one step probabilities and this one are equally formal. This is not an informal representation. And that's where we can actually make the claim that if someone asks you to define a discrete time Markov chain by just drawing um, the, trans the, the directed graph or the set of arrows between states and the probabilities, you fully define the process in a formal way. It's not um, a vague um, or imprecise way to define a process. It's actually uh, one um, side of this, what makes this work so nice is that it has a nice visual geometric element to it. Okay, so for every point in time and for every pair of states, you're gonna be draw setting out your picture um, like this but you'll have to draw your picture at every point in time because the probabilities could change as n gets larger. Definition 1.2 just simplifies things a little bit more. It says a random process is called time homogeneous if the one step probabilities don't change with time. Simple as that. The next theorem I think is really important. It's really important for people to try to do this themselves and it's missing from the notes, but it brings quite a lot of understanding, I think, um, to what we're trying to achieve. It says all conditional probabilities uh, can be calculated using regular matrix multiplication. And this is obviously true in a discrete time Markov chain. The reason this is quite amazing is because the, you'll see, the moment you, you have a definition for a discrete time mark of chain, I'll just draw one um, coming out of nowhere. If you wanted to count uh, the number of ways in which you could go from A to D in 400 steps, you're going to notice very quickly that it becomes uh, impossible to keep track of all possibilities. What this theorem tells you is that you can use matrix multiplication, which a computer can do incredibly quickly. Um, and you can keep track of all possibilities of all the combinations of ways of counting from A to D. Our human counting ability gives up quite quickly uh, in these problems. And very often you have to rely on um, computers to do really big ones. Um, and a very nice example of that is every time you do a Google search, there's actually a giant billion plus by a billion plus size matrix um, that's getting multiplied out because you, you actually see every website as a state in the Markov chain um, and computers can really efficiently multiply out big, big matrices like that. Um, and there's no hope of keeping track of that um, in, in any other way than mathematically. So uh, give this a shot. The hint, I guess, is that you'll have to use proof by mathematical induction. Um, but yeah, I think this is a key missing piece in the notes. Let's uh, make some of these ideas concrete with an example, and then it might be worth for you to go back and look at the other slides again. A motor insurer operator has, no, has a no claims discount system with the following levels of discount. So as I just said in the previous question, drawing out your random process is as formal as writing out the algebra. So it normally is quite um, nice to do these questions and draw the picture as you go along. So a person, a, a one policy holder can clearly be in any of these states of discount. The rules governing a policy holder's discount level based on the number of claims made in the previous year are as follows. Following a year with no claims, the policyholder moves up one discount level or moves or stays at the 60% level. So you know, you probably know someone starts at no claims discount. That's just an assumption. Um, unless they say otherwise, you can always assume um, the most obvious starting point is the starting point. And it's possible to move up um, the ranks or stay at 60 if you don't make any claims. So we know all of those steps are possible. Following a year with one claim, the policyholder moves down 
one discount level all remains at zero. So we also know that if you make one claim, you stay or you keep going down or you stay at the no discount level. And following the year with two or more claims, the policyholder moves down two discount levels um, subject to a limit of zero. So we know that if you're at 50, you could go down to zero. If you're at 25, we already said you could go down to zero. So we're not going to redraw that arrow. If you're at zero, you stay there. But we know if you could go from 60 to 25. So you can skip two steps in that way. And that really defines all the non-zero arrows of your Markov chain. The last bit of information tells us how to put probabilities to those arrows. So the number of claims we made, um, the number of claims made by a policyholder in a given year is assumed to follow a Poisson distribution with mean 0 0.3. So a Poisson distribution obviously takes out values 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And the question then asks, what is the discount a policyholder is expected to receive over 13 years? Okay, um, this information, uh, we will we'll now be able to assign probabilities to each of these arrows and assume wherever there's no arrow, like going from 60 to zero is zero. So where there's no arrow, there can't be a number. Um, and you can also represent that information as a matrix. So here we have in green, the states zero to, to 60. And then I just use the formula for the Poisson distribution to fill in the blanks. Where there are no arrows, you can see the zeros already. Um, and you'll be able to, um, with your basic memory of the Poisson distribution, you'll be able to replicate um, this matrix. You'll be able to also fill in each of those numbers in that matrix in this diagram if you wanted to. It's both an equal definition of the process. Then you, you'll see that P is what we've defined this matrix to be. And based on theorem, what did I call it? Theorem 1.2, you'll be able to see that the probability of going from, from step zero to any other step in N steps, so N ranges between one um, and 13, because we said for 13 periods, um, this uh, row vector tells you your initial condition. It tells you which position you started in. So we're starting in the no claims discount. We're interested in multiplying this matrix out 13 times and keeping track of every iteration. And that will tell us the probability of having moved from state zero to state, the respective states in n steps. So um, to give you a specific example, for every thousand rand in premiums received at time zero, we receive the following for time n. For we'll receive a thousand rand for times the probability of still being in the zero state at time n. You could have left and come back. You could have stayed in zero um, all along by constantly having claims. Plus the twenty-five percent discount and the times the probability of uh, being in the twenty-five percent discount state at time n and so on. So for the 50% discount and the 60% discount. And the answer that they are asking for is to sum from n equals 0 to 30. So that is the answer we're interested in. And that would be too big to do by hand. Um, so just already give you a taste of how helpful it is to let a computer multiply matrices out. I will attach a spreadsheet uh, called example 1.1. It will give you the full calculation and a little bit more information about the joint distributions and about uh, shortly you'll see the, uh, the long run distribution as well. So uh, have a look at the spreadsheet. Um, if you can fi find any mistakes, please let me know, but I think it should be okay. Um, and you can play around with choosing joint distributions that are two or three steps apart. Cool. Still the same question, question 1.1. The following data shows the number of uh, the insurer's 130,200 policyholders in a portfolio classified by the number of claims each policyholder made in the last year. 
the information was used to estimate the 0 0.3 in the first place. So they're giving us information about the number of claims for the total number of policyholders and asked us to test the goodness of fit for the model. Okay, the answer for this question, um, we just start by pointing out that we're making exactly two assumptions. And these two assumptions fully allow us to define the one-step probabilities, the one-step transition probabilities, and therefore the whole process. The first assumption we made is that the mark of property holds. The second assumption we made is that claims are Poisson distributed. To be able to test the mark of property, we would have to know the order in which policyholders were moving between states. It is not enough, just intuitively, to know at the end of the period how many claims were in each state. And that's an important point. So when we talk about you know, policyholders making no claims, that doesn't tell us anything about whether most of those people stayed in the zero claims or if many of them came from the one claim state um, and it's, um, it's very clear that that information can only be used to test the fact that the claims are Poisson distributed. Um, if we had to test the mark of property, um, this is what the notes provides as a possible test for goodness of fit. It's known as the test on triples. The null hypothesis is that the process has the mark of property and the alternative hypothesis is that it doesn't have the mark of property. It then produces um, this test statistic. It is outside the scope um, of this course to know the degrees of freedom for this test statistic. It only tells us that it's a chi-square distribution. So if they ever ask this question in an exam, they will have to provide a formula for coming up with the degrees of freedom for this test statistic. This formula is quite daunting. It's quite confusing. And the simplest way to get to grips with it is to do one example. And the notes gives that to you. So it will show you information um, in a sequence as you would need to have known to be able to test the mark of property. Please do the example from the notes to get to grips with this triple summation. Um, hopefully, if this kind of question gets asked in the exam, they're not trying to test how quickly you can plug things into a formula. They'll give you some of the test statistics. Maybe they'll give you the, you know, the answer you need for some of the numerators or something like that. Um, so let's do what we can with the data we've got uh, and test the, the Poisson distribution. You'll remember the goodness of fit for uh, distribution follows that test statistic. And if you plug this information, uh, this is the actual information with the expected information that you plug into the Poisson distribution, um, you will actually get that we reject um, the null hypothesis. So we actually know that the Poisson distribution doesn't make a very good distribution for modeling uh, the claims of car accidents. Um, you can go look up from your first year notes. Uh, there are a couple of premises that, that uh, were made in order to uh, derive the Poisson distribution. And it actually is quite easy if you go through that list to see you know, which of those properties you wouldn't actually expect car, car accidents to, um, to have. Um, so it's not a really big surprise that the Poisson distribution doesn't hold. Cool, that gives us a test statistic for the market property. Uh, if it's not obvious, uh, let me just point out again that um, if we had definition for all the one-step probabilities, we only needed to make one assumption to fully define the random process. So the Markov property really uh, makes it simple to define processes with as little information as possible. Theorem 1.3 says, state and prove the relationship between the Poisson distribution and the exponential distribution. Now the Poisson distribution is a discrete distribution or discrete random variable, it's not even a process, it's just a distribution of you know, um, a single random variable, and this one is continuous. And it's one of the big punchlines of the course, we're gonna get back to this in part five, uh, and we actually come back to fill in this in more detail. But there's a very deep relationship between the Poisson distribution and the exponential distribution, even though they seemingly look like they have nothing to do with each other. Okay. We've done one example 
of the probability theory between the behind discrete time Markov chains. And if you didn't quite catch that first one, you can play around with the spreadsheet a little bit. Um, but it is, um, there will be so many questions for you to work through. Even later in this course, there'll be some discrete uh, time questions. Um, we will now look at the statistics. So in other words, looking at uh, the, if we had real data for a Markov chain. So if you want to pause at this point and first do a few more examples of discrete time Markov chains, you're welcome to. Otherwise, let's look at some of the statistics. Consider a discrete time Markov chain with transition probability matrix P. And we said, if you know the initial condition and that matrix, the process is fully defined. I'm gonna keep repeating it until it sinks in. Taking values in the set one to M, so that's your state space. We want the maximum likelihood estimators of the transition probabilities P, I, J of that matrix. And you can see that they're going to ask us to describe the data that we require to estimate the parameters. Um, the formula that we would expect to come out of the maximum likelihood function and then to actually prove that formula. And then there's a little afterthought question B. So describe the data required to estimate the, the parameters of this process. So this is a generic, uh, completely generic discrete time Markov chain. And the answer is simply a sequence um, of states. So it tells us how the process evolved from one discrete time to the other. So if that's not obvious, you know, it could be something like 1, M, 2, 2, 3, 4, 8, M. It, as long as there's one sequence, you could have many sequences, which are also helpful, but you actually just need at least one in order to estimate these parameters. So intuitively, they're asking us to state without proof the formula for those maximum likelihoods. So remember the maximum likelihood estimate in some sense uh, gives us the optimal estimate for a parameter given that there is no information available to us outside of the data. You might not have heard that before, a Bayesian estimate, um, which you'll do in some of your third year courses, allows you to pull together prior information you have about, a, uh, or a subjective information you have about a parameter and pull that with the data. A maximum likelihood estimate is a special case of that where we have no prior information, we completely rely on the data to set the parameter for us. So what would we intuitively um, use the data for to estimate these parameters? Well, the probability of moving from state I to state J, you should count. So this is the number of transitions between I and J. And you want to divide that by the sum of all transitions out of I. So I guess So um, we'll do plenty of, of practical examples. I hope that makes some intuitive sense. The maximum likelihood estimate, however, has to be proven formally, even though it coincides with our, at the end of the day, it coincides with our intuitive um, idea uh, of what the estimate should be. It's actually really comforting to our theory of maximum likelihood estimates. that If we go through this whole long proof and we get to our intuitive answers, that the theory is quite sound. Okay. So to ref refresh your memory, the likelihood function, which you want to maximize, the first step is to write down the probability of seeing the data that you're seeing. So it's just the joint distribution of having seen x1 all the way to xt. So that is your likelihood function. We can then apply the chain rule to that function, which we now just switch to the terminology that we have here for one step conditional probabilities. So this step here is just a notation change. 
So that's an example. This is P with the subscript X1 to X2. Okay, and we raise it to the power of number of cases. So once you've written out all the one-step probabilities, you've obviously also applied the Markov property. We now group them where I and J are equal. So we run through all pairs and it's a product and we raise it to the power of the number of times that we see a transition between state I and J. Does that make sense? I hope so. I'm talking to myself. Um, what we always do with likelihood functions um, is we take the logs because almost always it's easier to differentiate over a summation than over a product. And that gives us a double summation where we can take that um, natural log with the, with the n to the front. At this point, um, I wanna show something important. If we had to, we, now we're interested, at, say at this point, in differentiating um, with respect to pij, because that's the parameter we're trying to estimate, and we want to set that equal to zero. At this point, if we said, well, we're only interested in pij, the, um, that's actually only one term in this whole long double summation that relates to pij. So technically, that, the answer should be nij divided by pij, remember nij is a constant, equals zero. And that gives us a nonsense answer. Can you think for yourself for a minute, pause the video if necessary, to figure out what went wrong in the step? Why couldn't we just have differentiated with respect to that one parameter and maximize it? Well, the answer is that there is a constraint in the uh, relationship between the PIJs that you cannot ignore because we know that the pijs um, come from a probability matrix, the rows have to sum to one. So summing across um, all the j's um, has to produce the answer one. So summing across the columns. So the way in which to do that is to remember the relationship that pii is equal to one minus the sum of PIK, where K is not equal to I to M. So the, the value on the diagonal is one minus the sum of all the other probabilities. And if you just use that relationship over here and you just tease out the PII um, term in this long summation, and you express it as one minus, you'll actually see that pij appears once over here and once over there. So you've now properly accounted for the constraint in your optimization problem. Now you can differentiate with respect to pij. Um, the minus here comes from the minus on the inside of the natural log, and now we're left with this expression. The, this, so we've already, this is the first trick, the one here expressing PIJ um, as one, P, or taking PIJ and expressing it as a piece of PII. Um, this, that was the first trick. The second trick is to sum across all J at this point. It's just a trick that you have to remember um, to be able to make, to do, to do this proof. And once you, take the summation over j, we've already said summing over pij, summing across all the columns, has to give you one. So that's how that term falls away. You now juggle things around. And interestingly, the expression just before you summed across j, you have to plug that back in to the expression. You just use the fact that you derived before you take summa so took a summation on both sides across J, and that is how you get to the answer. So that is three tricks that you need to remember in one proof.
but here you'll actually get to the expression that we intuitively came up with on the on the previous slide so it's actually really satisfying to know that our general theory of maximum likelihood still coincides with our intuition example 1.3 now asks us given that we've already used the statistics to estimate our parameters um, how can we simulate uh, an instance of this model and we're going to do it now in the discrete case and we're going to repeat it again in the continuous case um, it says consider the following three, st three state discrete time Markov chain, they call it the HSD model. It's from the introduction as well. It's, a, it's an example that comes up all the time in this course. So they expect you to know which transitions relate um, to which states. I will just show you again here. You've got healthy, sick, and dead. Going from healthy to sick is easy to remember. It's sigma, sigma for sick. Going from sick to healthy is to recover. So that's rho, 0.7. Dying is just mu as you're used to. And in this case, they say um, they have a special transition. Uh, normally we call it nu or with, a, with a V, but in this case, they're giving us a little bit more information. They're saying it's, um, it's mu plus alpha. Uh, this is a standard healthy sick dead model. It says simulate from this model showing your workings using the following numbers generated from an independent uniform distribution on the interval zero one. So this last little piece uh, simulating from an independent uniform distribution in the interval zero one is how all simulations happen. But normally all simulations happen from a uniform distribution. That's because it's simpler and there is actually a theorem that you'll learn in a different stats course that says that you can always just simulate from a uniform distribution and make a transformation to get to the distribution that you're interested in. So it's asking us to simulate from this Markov chain. In other words, we, start, we definitely start off as healthy. That's the presumption. And now we're going to move between these states just four, four times based on these four randomly selected uniform distribution variables. So our outcome is gonna be something like healthy, sick, staying in sick and dying, and then staying in the dead state, or it will be healthy, sick, recovering, um, and staying healthy and maybe dying. These are all examples um, of what they're asking us to do, but there's only four. So I guess the four times something will happen, um, so that the, the, our initial condition doesn't count. So it's four after that point. So these are two examples of what we could get from the simulation exercise. And I'm gonna show you how to do that now. So I just wrote that those four numbers in a table underneath each other. Now, all we're going to do is starting from the healthy state age, um, we now take the interval we, we now put our focus on the healthy state and we see that one of two things can happen. We can either, or sorry, one of three things can happen. We can either stay in the healthy state um, with probability 0 0.9, or we can go to the sick state or go to the dead state. So starting off in the healthy state. So we divide our interval between zero and one into exactly those probabilities. There's a 90% chance that we stay healthy. So we allocate zero to 0 0.9 inclusive to be in the healthy state. We then uh, allocate 0 0.9 to 0 0.99 to move into the sick state because we know that's 0 0.09. And then the remaining of the band, we allocate to the probability of being dead. So we do this upfront without knowing what these random numbers are. And we upfront agree that if the number falls between 0 and 0 0.9, we're gonna say it sticks in the healthy. We could have allocated the bands differently if we wanted to we could have let the last 0.9 uh, between 0 0.1 and 1 all count as being the healthy state, as long as you're consistent in the method you're using. I just decided healthy, sick, dead is you know, the natural formulation, so I'll make the first 0.9 relate to the healthy state. So now come the information about the randomly simulated number. Surprise, surprise, it falls into this first band, by far the most likely band. So we're still in the healthy state. So you'll see that the second line still says we're still in the healthy state. This first 
and second line looks exactly the same. This time, however, we're simulating from something in the second band. So the first time we simulated, we fell into that band. Now we fall into the sixth state, quite an unlucky, uh, unlikely event, but it happened. So we now know that we fall into the sixth state. Now we have to change our focus. We are now, from the perspective of the sixth state, we can either recover with probability 0.7, or we could die with probability 0.05. So this has to be 0.25 probability. Staying in the, going to the healthy state has probability 0.7. So we just allocated the first 0.7 of the interval to going back to the healthy state. Then adding 0.25 to the next piece of the band staying in the sixth state. And then the last point 0.05 would count as going to the dead state. So this time we return to the healthy state because um, again, the most likely event happened, which was this first one. And now we back from the, um, from, the, uh, from the healthy state's perspective. So you'll again see we return back to that band. This time we are simulating again from the healthy state. So quite a, uh, you know, it could have been way more boring if the most likely thing kept happening, we would have just stayed in the healthy state all of this time, but a little thing happened over there. Obviously, once you go to the dead state, the full band is allocated to staying in the dead state and you don't even have to worry about um, simulating further. You know, once you in the dead state, you stay there. Okay, I think example 1.4 captures um, some of the main ideas of, of this section. I think it's a good idea for you to pause the video, try to answer these questions yourself. I will post some written solutions uh, on Vula in the next week or two.